So this morning I want to talk about the mystery of altars. The mystery of altars. Next week I will talk about something else, God willing. And uh, on and on and on. Until the month is done. Because God has purposed to bless you. And uh, one of these days I will be dealing with some New Testament mysteries. There are those in the present day some. There are some of those in the present day charismatic movement who think that we don't need to be blessed again because Jesus has given us all the blessings. And they refer to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. And they say things like, you know, um, you know I don't deal with NLT when I'm preaching. Uh -huh. Authorized King James. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. And they now emphasize who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And they say if we have all the blessings in heavenly spiritual blessings in heavenly places then we don't need anybody to bless us again. We are already blessed. We are already blessed. But the very verse they are quoting contradicts even what they are teaching because the first blessed that is mentioned there is to somebody who cannot, who doesn't need to be blessed. What did he say? Blessed be who? The God. Which God? The God of all blessings. That's, and yet you are saying that blessed be the God of our Father, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you are blessing God. And you got the blessing from God and say you don't need to be blessed again. That is one thing that defeats their argument. Number two thing that would defeat their argument. The Bible qualified the blessings. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. What kind of blessings are we blessed with? Spiritual and that is not the only kind of blessing available. We have material blessings. The Bible talks about the blessings of the soul. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. So the soul has his blessings and can bless. Isaac told his son, he said, make me venison such as I love. And after I've eaten, my soul will bless you. So there is the blessing of the spirit. There is the blessing of the soul. And there is the blessing of the body. That's why you can say, my hands are blessed with the blessings of the Lord. So there is the blessing that comes upon your hands and your hands are not spiritual. That's why I can hold it. And if I use a needle and pierce it, blood will come out. So somebody say, my hands are blessed. Hands are blessed. So that is material blessings. And we have the blessings of the soul. That's why Jesus could make statements in the Beatitudes. He talked about the blessings of the soul. What is the soul? One of these days, I'll be dealing with the trichotomy of man. Or the, the trinity of man. We'll be talking about these things. And you understand that the soul is made up of your will, your mind, your emotions. Somebody say, my will, my emotions, and my mind. That is your soul. So that means that emotions are part of the soul. That's the, level, the, the psychological level. And Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the merciful, those who are capable of showing compassion. Not everybody can show compassion. There are people now, you are walking, and then you hit your leg against a stone. They'll say, eh -heh. Eh -heh. your leg crushed are broken. Haven't I told you when you are walking, you should open your eyes and be looking. <laughs> he cannot even sympathize with you. But it's another person who is walking and he's his leg against the stone, and somebody grabs his own leg. They say, Why? 
He's feeling it with you, even though it's not his leg. And he's holding his own leg as though that was the leg that he destroyed. Somebody say blessed. blessed. And merciful. Sometimes we think that the blessing is a car. Yes, those, those are the material blessings. But the blessing also affects your, your emotional realm. And if you are compassionate, you are blessed. If you are compassionate, you are blessed. The fact that you can feel the hurt of others and feel the grief, the pain of other people and sympathize with them and show them love. The Bible says you are blessed, cry. Because not everybody has that type of... There are some people when you are in pain, they say you haven't even said anything yet. God is just beginning. By the time my God is done with you, you will know that I am the apple of God's eye and that I am a Holy Ghost naked wire. If he touch me, I will shock you. So you are happy your friend is going through, or somebody you call your enemy is going through that kind of stuff, and you think that it is God who is paying that person back. If you do that, the Bible says you are not blessed. I don't want to use the other word. The Bible says you are not blessed, because a blessed person should even feel for people who persecute him. Those who persecute, you should even feel for them and say, Lord, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. Not that you say, Lord, all these people who are doing this thing to me, Lord, open heaven, rain thunder and fire. Let them roast. Hell fire will not be, it will be their portion forever. You are wishing somebody hell. You are not blessed. Praise the Lord. That's what the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart. The fact that you have a clean heart, you care for people. No, no, libi, libi, no, laba, laba. When somebody is progressing, it's not like you show your teeth as though you are happy and you go home and you are weeping. If you have a pure heart, you are blessed. It's not just a cow, but if you have a pure heart, you are Somebody say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Now your neighbor bought a second hand bicycle and you had heart attack. <laughs> and you had heart attack. Because this guy was your boyfriend and another lady came and the, the boy left you. And I'm married. On their wedding day, you say you won't come. That one is okay. Maybe you couldn't contain it. <laughs> That's all right. If you are not coming, then don't come. You stay at home and let us have the wedding. But as if that is not enough, you are in the house praying. This marriage will collapse. This marriage will not work. So that it doesn't work and you will be happy because the guy dumped you. Somebody say, blessed are the pure in heart. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Some people, their first imagination concerning somebody is usually negative. By now, this guy must be a bad guy. Look at how he's walking. Look, 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 look. Look, look. <laughs> You think negatively of people. Praise God. No. Have a clean mind. You see, the Bible says that uh, uh, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are, of, are just, whatever things are of a good report, the things, you know, that, that are of a good report and clean, all those things, you should think on these things. Think on these things. Allow your mind to be, to be so pure that you don't allow negative things. Think on these things. That report you are giving concerning a brother, is it pure? He said, yes, it, it's not pure, but it's true. <laughs> it doesn't qualify for your mind. Even though it's true, it's not pure. So it has failed the if, uh, Philippians 4 a test. It is true, but it's not pure. And what you are saying concerning that brother, is it lovely? If they have said that about you, will you say, oh, thank you very much. You know, it's my pleasure. W would you be happy? If somebody said those negative things about you, would you be happy? You wouldn't. So it's not lovely. It's not lovely. So when you saw somebody as an idiot, it's not lovely. Just imagine that it's your wife's birthday and you, you want to show her love. Or it's Val's day. You want to show her love. You went and bought flowers and brought it. Stood before that wonderful man and said, you're an idiot. Then you handed a flower. Is that lovely? 
So anytime you are telling someone, you see, what is not qualified to be in your mind is not qualified to come out of your mouth. Because it proceeds. The mind is the root. The mouth is the fruit. So if it doesn't even qualify to proceed from the mind, then how can it come out of your mouth? Because out of the abundance of the things that are in your mind or your heart, then the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks. Praise God. Amen. So, blessings are very, very powerful things. And we should understand that we still need some kind of blessings. And we'll be looking at all these things. And one of the sources of the blessings is at the altar. So, I'm dealing with what I've captioned the mystery of altars. Somebody said the mystery of altars. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. I prefer this approach to dealing with the scriptures because that is how I actually grew. It was being relaxed, doing a Bible study, grows people better. Amen? Because thunder doesn't grow grass. <laughs> it is the rain. It is the nutrients that grows it. Praise God. Hallelujah. When I was growing up, I thought a good preacher was one who could shout and change his voice and do something. I said, this man is preaching, man. But then at the end, I sit down, I look, I say, what did he say? Oh, he said many things. You can't find content. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And content is always far, far, far better than package. Even though packaging is also important. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. I love that. Somebody say the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing or those who are not saved but to those of us who are born again saved it is to us the power of God it is to us the power of God and when we talk about the cross what is the cross? the cross is the place of sacrifice that is the altar of Christ an altar is a place of sacrifice and the cross was the place where Jesus was sacrificed. And as a matter of fact, to prove to you that the cross of Jesus Christ represents an altar, if you go back into the Old Testament, you would realize that there is a typology of Jesus Christ almost on every altar. What used to happen on altars back then was a type of what was to happen on Calvary. So all the altars were working towards Calvary. They were all symbolisms pointing towards Calvary. Praise God. For example, God told Abraham, he said, Abi, take now your son. He could have carried Ishmael away and gone to slaughter him. And God immediately made it very specific. He said, take now your son. He said, Ishmael, you are finished today. He said, no, your only son. Now, the Bible calls angels sons of God. He says the sons of God came and had affair with the daughters of men. In the book of Job, the Bible says the morning star sang for, sang for joy and the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, that is re referring to angels. So angels are also called sons of God. And yet the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only. So God also told Abraham, take now Isaac, thy only son. Your only son. So we see that Isaac is a type of Christ. Isaac was called Abraham's only son. Jesus was God's only son. Even though angels are also referred to as sons. Now, Isaac, Isaac, if you look at the text, he said, Whom thou lovest. God also called Jesus my beloved son in whom I am well pleased so you see the similarities then you proceed when Abraham was taking Isaac to, 
to lay him on the altar. They climbed the mountain. And when Jesus was also going to the altar to be crucified, he went up to Mount Calvary. So both were crucified on a mountain. Three, four. When Isaac was going up, he carried the wood on his shoulders to the altar. When Jesus was also going up to the altar, he carried the cross, which is wood, to the altar. And when they got to the place, Isaac was tied to the wood. When Jesus also got there, he was also tied to the cross. And in the place of Isaac, God gave the lamb. And it was the lamb that was finally sacrificed on the altar of Abraham. And Jesus is called the lamb of God. And it was the lamb of God that was finally crucified on the cross. So, and where Isaac was slain was an altar. So where Jesus was slain of necessity had to also be an altar. So the cross of Jesus is an altar of God. And an altar is simply any place where sacrifices are made. The place where sacrifices are made. And the Bible is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 the text I just read it says that the cross is to people that are perishing foolishness but to those of us who are born again sanctified, spirit filled tongue speaking, Holy Ghost filled and you know we understand that the cross of Jesus is the power of God so people call the cross foolishness but we see it as power somebody say power so the cross is a place of power the cross is a place so the altar is a place of power am i speaking sense so everything you actually need in life is available on an altar everything you need power is something that is available you don't get power in the supermarket you can't go to melcom and say i want power he say what kind of power he say spiritual power economic power whatever political power no, you don't get it from Malcolm. That tap is not available for sale in a supermarket. The only place where power can be traded is on the altar. Somebody say altar. Okay. Let me show you this. Take me to Revelation chapter 5 verse 12. Let me work this thing. I hope I will be able to go somewhere. Saying with a loud voice. Please read together with me. Let's go. One, two saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings somebody says slain to receive slain to receive not slain to die but slain to receive where on the altar and jesus was crucified on the altar so the altar is a place where things die things are slain but when those things are slain they are not slain to die they are slain for the one offering them on the altar to receive because the altar is not just a place of death it's a place of exchange it's a place for covenant transactions and when Jesus was, was laid on the altar, he wasn't slain on the altar to die. He was slain to receive. That's why when you slay your money on this altar, it's not slain to die. It's slain for you to receive. When you lay your life on the altar in the service of God, it is not slain for you to, to lose. It is slain for you to receive. Everything that parts away from you in the service of God, it is that is not going to live your life forever. It is leaving you now and stepping into your future, waiting for you. Slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Which means that these things are available on the altar for trade. That is why people looking for power go to the altar. Politicians go to the altar to sacrifice all manner of things. Many years ago, 
just one of the polytechnics in northern region. Did I say you are poly? I said one of the polytechnics in northern region. You know, there, there was this contest for SRC president. And one of the guys who was contesting happened to be an old Ganaskan. I knew him personally. And he, this guy contested. And guess what he did? Part of their rituals, they went and saw their, their, their juju men and what have you. And he was supposed to bury a live cow on the campus. Somebody says slain. slain. To receive. Power. power. He wanted power. And only God knows how many other things are being buried and slain for some people who want power. Because for you to receive power, power of any sort, economic power, political power, whatever power, it usually anchors on the altar. Because the altar is the place where power proceeds. That is why a man of altars is a man of power. A man of altars is a man of riches. That You see, when people want riches, they go again to the altar to transact some business. You see, a lot of these worldly businessmen, the kind of things they do, they keep making their sacrifices, they keep... It, it's, it's amazing how the worldly people understand the mystery of altars, but believers don't. Believers don't. Praise the Lord. Everything you need in life is available on the altar. It's available on the altar. Wisdom, even wisdom. If you want wisdom, you get it from the altar. How did Solomon get his wisdom? He got it from an altar. You may debate that, but let me show you. First Kings chapter 3, verse 4. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. When we talk about a high place in the Old Testament, it usually referred to an altar. An altar is considered an elevated ground. It is considered a high place. A thousand burnt offering did Solomon offer upon that altar. Next verse. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. After the 1,000 burnt offerings, God appeared to him and said, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, give me an understanding heart and give me wisdom. And God said, I will not only give you wisdom, I will also add riches to it. Somebody say riches. Because if you have wisdom without riches, nobody will regard you because a poor man's wisdom is not heard. The Bible says his, his wisdom is dispersed, uh, despised. And his voice is not heard. His voice is not heard. Sometimes it looks like America has the best preachers and teachers. It's not like that. It's money that gave them a voice money as a voice to your wisdom you can't I believe I'm one of the best teachers in the whole wide world you can debate that but I am those who are not clapping what is your problem it's true and when I'm talking I'm not talking about second hand knowledge second hand knowledge where you pick somebody's revelation you, you claim you no I'm talking about men, all these things I'm teaching I didn't read them from a book I read it from the Bible I just most of the things I teach I pick the Bible I open the Bible and I begin to see things I just begin to see things praise God hallelujah yes but many people download second hand knowledge and they say you know and they tell all kinds of lies that they got it fresh no it's a lie my own is fresh <laughs> Mercy. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh yeah. But you see, right now, Americans don't know about me because money will make them know me. 
as I preach here, our, our messages are being broadcasted on about 85 times per week. He said, Why did he use the money? No, 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 please. It's not your money. It is people in the one or two people in the church and others outside the church who are paying for it. The church only pays for two, two radio stations. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. But you see, there are people all across who hear our messages on radio and what have you. And the question is, how can I be here and preaching to people in Upper East, in Upper West, in so many other places? It is money. We didn't pray to be there. We paid to be there. So wisdom is not enough. Riches as a voice to your wisdom. Am I speaking sense? But how did Solomon contact the wisdom? He sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings and God showed up that night. He didn't pray, he sacrificed and God showed up and said, Solo, you've shocked me. What at all do you want in this world? He said, I want wisdom. And God said, I will not only give you wisdom, I will add wealth. I said, and you will retire in a good old age. Praise the Lord. So longevity will answer to the altar. Wisdom answer to the altar. Understanding answer to the altar. Wealth answer to the altar. So when you begin to offer this, understand that the altar is a mysterious ground. Am I speaking sense? Hello? Hello? So the altar is a mysterious place. You say, what is an altar? I can't define it. The best I can do is to explain. Spiritual things are usually very difficult to define. Like somebody said, what is the anointing? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know what it is, but I know when it is not there. That's what an old divine said. So, there are some things that are better explained than defined. For example, Jesus was asked, who is your neighbor? And he began by saying there was a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho caught up by robbers and beaten. And the priest came and passed, the Levites came and passed, everybody came and passed except the Samaritan who came and the Bible actually says the rest of them came walking. They, they walked past. The rest, they walked past. Then the Samaritan came with his donkey and picked this man, put him on the donkey, and took him to a hospital. And for taking the man to the hospital, the Bible calls him a good Samaritan. In fact, Jesus himself calls the man a good Samaritan. So, helping somebody who is sick to go to the hospital is not an act of little faith. I don't know where you come from, but <clears throat> we probably might call you the good Voltaire. Or we might call you the good Bulsa. Amen? Yeah. I want to also believe that it was easier for the man to carry the sick person because he had a donkey. The rest were walking. Imagine you have to carry a man with blood and put him on your shoulder and the blood is dripping. In fact, your shoulder, the bones from your shoulder will kill him. But they took him and put him on a donkey and sat on it and took him to the city. Praise God. Hallelujah. And Jesus now asks, which of these men is a neighbor? And it was very obvious. They chose the Samaritan. He had defined a neighbor to them like that. So who is a neighbor? Praise God. <laughs> Amen. So Jesus usually used those type of things. For example, he wants to explain the kingdom of God. He didn't say the kingdom of God is so and so. No, he said the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. Which a man took and sowed in his field. Oh, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who took three measures of meal and put it in bread and it leavened the whole lump. Oh, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field which a man found and went away, sold everything he had to buy that treasure. 
he always said the kingdom of God is like the kingdom of God is like he kept on using natural things to explain spiritual things in the same way if you want to ask me what is an altar I would only have to describe it but I cannot define it an altar is an escape route from the grave that's one way to explain it it's like an escape route from the grave Matthew 27 verse 50 to 53 when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost and behold the veil of the temple was rent in twine from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the grave were open the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the grave after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many that's the number one thing an altar is like an escape route from the grave it's the gateway out of the spirit realm and the gateway into the spirit realm that's why even in our traditional homes our fathers had pieces of stones if they wanted to talk to their ancestors supposedly they will come before that, that stone and that is where they believed that they could access the ancestors they poured water and poured their sacrifices on that stone it was their access point into the spirit realm the same thing applied in the old testament and now the bible says when jesus raised that altar on calvary and what he hung on the cross and his blood began to drip on the ground the bible says the graves the, the graves were opened and the veil that closed the door into the holy of holies that gave them access into the presence of god where the manifest presence of god could be found was opened so the altar is the key that gives you access into spirit realms into strange dimensions and the bible says the graves were opened graves were opened and came out of and the dead saints that were buried before came out that means abraham came out lazarus came out isaac came out jacob came out Isaiah came out all the prophets of old who were in the grave they came out you see before then they were not in heaven praise God in the old testament if you died you didn't go to heaven straight you went down somebody say down you went to hell whether you were a saint or a criminal but when we talked about hell hell I, if you get my message on understanding hell there were three compartments in fact there are three types of hell in the old testament if you went down we had a part that was known as in fact all of it was in greek it was known as hades and in hebrew it's known as sheol and if you went into sheol or hades they had one compartment that contained fire and the other compartment was green and cool that was known as abraham's bosom and the other part contained fire so in the story of the rich man and lazarus the rich man went to the place that contained the fire and lazarus went to abraham's bosom and there is yet another type of hell also known as titaros or the abyss which is also translated as the bottomless pit and that one it is fallen angels that are locked there not human beings and all of them are awaiting a day after the great white throne judgment that's why the book of revelation now says that and i saw that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire so when that day now comes that present hell that contains the people now will be carried everything will be taken and cast into the lake of fire which is the eternal hell so that hell is temporal so when jesus died the bible says that as soon as his blood touched the ground the graves were opened and all the dead saints abraham and co who were in abraham's bosom or paradise the bible says that as soon as jesus died the graves opened up by reason of the altar that he had raised it opened up the graves and all these dead saints came out that's what the bible means by jesus went down to the prisons 
He's talking about that place. Even where Abraham was, he's called a prison. He said, and preach to them. And all of them now led all of them. And they had to receive him because they were anticipating him. That's why they lived in righteousness. So they received him and Jesus led them from the grave all the way up. According to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 onwards. He led captivity captives and led them in a the, in the great parade all the way up to heaven. So he that descended was the same person who ascended. Am I teaching something? So he led them out of the thing and took them up to heaven. Praise God. This is very important. You need to understand this. Why didn't they go straight to heaven? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by him. Not even Abraham could go to the Father without knowing Jesus. Not even uh, 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 Isaac or Jacob or Moses could go to the Father. So none of them, Jesus said, no man has seen God before. And no man had ever seen the Father. He said, except the Son who came from the Father. So none of them had ever seen the Father. So even when they died, what they called their heaven was Abraham's bosom. Was Abraham's bosom. They didn't go to God, the Father of Fathers. But when Jesus came by the altar, he led them into heaven. And the Bible says they came out of the graves. And some of us are living even in the graves whilst we are yet alive. Like the madman of Gadara, he was living in tombs whilst alive. Your business can be in the tombs whilst you are yet alive. Your career can be in the tombs whilst alive. And you are cutting yourself out of pain and in agony. Your marriage can be in the tomb. It's just a name that it is alive, but this thing is dead. And you have a name that this business is alive, but it is dead. But I don't know what is dead in your life. And the Bible says that when Jesus raised up that altar, the graves were opened and every dead saint came out. And I am here to prophesy over somebody's life that every dead thing in your life that thing that is dead that business that is dead that marriage that is dead that career that is dead by the altar of covering I command it to come out I said I command it to come out can I hear your amen roll like thunder so the altar is a means by which you can call things back you can call things back. He says, and everything came out of the grave after the resurrection. So that's why when you read the Old Testament, it says, oh, all the dead saints, they were sleeping. For they will rise again. Praise God. The altar is a ladder that connects you to the top. The altar is a place that connects, it's a ladder that connects you to the top. Amen. This is a very, very important principle. I think I've explained this and um, some of you already know this. So let me summarize it in five minutes and go to the next point. Genesis chapter 12 verse 7. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. You see how God related with Abraham. He said, I will give you this land. And he built an altar. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, watch this. Abraham was a man of altars. Everywhere he went, he built altars, he raised altars. And one of the altars that Abraham raised here was, was on a land known as Bethel, or some say Bethel. But it's Bethel in, 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 in Hebrew. So he raised his altar at Bethel. And several years down the lane. And the altar, he built it on the land that God said, I'm going to give to you. Several years down the lane. After Isaac, his son was dead and gone. Uh, uh, rather, when Abraham himself was dead and gone. One day, his grandson, by name Jacob, was running away from his brother Esau. And as he was running... He got to the same land known as Bethel. And night caught up with him. And the Bible says he picked up a stone. According to Hebrew traditions, uh, he took up one of the scattered stones of Abraham's broken altar. That's his grandfather. Now the man is dead and gone. And the stones on the altar are scattered. 
but there was still an invisible presence in that very place where his grandfather had raised an altar that should tell you that altars are transgenerational that's why sometimes during times of prophecy they will say there's an altar that is fighting you and you don't see any physical altar but this thing was built and after the stones are scattered there is still an invisible entry at the very point where the altar was raised that's why it's a dangerous thing to be involved in dealing with negative altars if it's a positive altar it will work for your children and grandchildren if it's a negative altar you are also building it and it will affect that's why there's nothing like good juju mm -mm. there's nothing like that you are building a negative altar that will affect your children and your grandchildren you have a talisman you hang inside your room nobody knows about it and you have a, an internal belt and an uh, external belt the belt that is visible and the belt that is invisible one for protection one for beauty it's a dangerous thing it's a negative altar so the bible says jacob got to that very place and guess what happened the bible says in verse 11 of genesis 28 and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and took the stones of that place and put for and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep next verse he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth somebody say ladder so the place where abraham raised the altar was a place that there was a ladder connecting heaven and earth and the top of it reached to heaven behold the angels of god ascending and descending on it that's why when jesus raised that altar on calvary it was a ladder it was a connection between earth and heaven years before people had tried to build a tower from the earth all the way up to heaven at the tower of babel they didn't succeed because they tried to do so by works but it takes an altar to be able to connect to heaven so when jesus died and raised that altar that altar became the only highway available for mankind to move from earth realm to heaven so spirits traveled on the highways not on this type of roast asphalt no they travel on a ladder created by altars and the bible says the altar of abraham became a ladder where angels were ascending and descending i'm not sure they were coming down empty-handed they were loading goods and bring it going back and loading some more may angels load some goods for somebody here i say may angels load good for somebody here and behold the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham. Whose altar it is? Abraham. So this guy is dreaming. And God is up there and saying, Hey, where you are is a holy place. This is the altar of Abraham. He said, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, the land where thou liest. I will give to you and to thy seed. Do you remember the same thing God told Abraham? He said, the land where you are standing, I will give to you. And that's where Abraham built the altar. Now he's telling him, the land where you are lying, I will give to you. Because you are Abraham's seed. It belongs to you. So these are to possess lands, altars. I'm building my case slowly. Verse 16, and Jacob waked out of his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. He was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. He called the altar the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Hmm. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it up for a pillar. That's for an altar. And poured oil on the top of it. Now, he didn't have anything to sacrifice because as he was traveling, the only thing he carried was a bag containing his water, his oil, and then his staff and a spare cloth. So what was he to sacrifice? So he took the oil which was precious to him, opened it, and poured it upon the altar, and entered into a covenant with God, and said, if you take me safely to my father's, my uncle's place, and bring me back, he said, I will pay a tenth of all my earnings. I will pay a tenth look at the mystery it was in the place of the altar that jacob began even to walk in abrahamic blessings 
and he started paying tight from there those of us who have problem with tight nowadays i see a lot of people arguing on facebook and they are oh tight is old testament tight is old testament tight is old testament when you say old testament old testament is not genesis to malachi old testament is exodus chapter 19 to malachi because old testament the old testament or mosaic covenant was enacted in exodus chapter 19 so genesis is not part of the old testament Old Testament, even Exodus chapter 1, all the way to chapter 18, is not part of Old Testament. The Old Testament, every good theologian will tell you, the Old Testament began in Exodus chapter 19. And this is Jacob, way before the Old Testament was enacted by Moses. He was already paying tithe. The Bible says, Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. A tithe of all, not some. A tithe of what? All. That was before the Old Testament was enacted. So if tight didn't come through the Old Testament, why should it go because the Old Testament is no longer there? Tight came before the Old Testament. And now Old Testament is going. And you want tight to follow it and go. Who is the senior? And who should follow the other? You see, the only difference is that tight was already there. Abraham was paying tight. Uh, uh, Isaac, Jacob, they were paying tight. But when Moses now came and was enacting the covenant, he now made the tithe a law. That became a law of tithe. And when Jesus came, he didn't say, Don't pay tithe. He said, These things you ought to have done, but not neglecting the weightier matters, which is what? Taking care of the poor, taking care of the needy, uh, uh, showing them affection and, and what have you. So the fact that there are needy people doesn't mean you shouldn't pay tithe. You do, the, you pay your tithe, and also handle the weightier matters of the law. Am I speaking sense? It's very important. So tithe is not Old Testament. As a matter of fact, the New Testament is built on Abrahamic covenant. It's built on Abrahamic covenant, and so you watch this. You see that when Abraham met Melchizedek, the Bible says Abraham paid tithe of all. And there were three things. Jesus is a high priest, not of the order of Levi. Levi is one of the sons of Jacob. And when Moses enacted the law or the, the, or the Old Testament, he made the Levites the pastors in the tabernacle. Are you, are you following me? Yes, he made the tribe of Levi. They were those to serve in the house of God. And Aaron was the high priest. But Jesus didn't become a high priest in the order of Aaron. He became a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And the Bible didn't tell us many things after, about Melchizedek. Only three things are said about Melchizedek. When he met Abraham, look at what happened between them. The only thing that happened between them was that, number one, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. That was one. Number two, Melchizedek gave Abraham bread and wine. These are the only two things that Melchizedek did for Abraham. And what else did Melchizedek do? He received tithe from Abraham. And Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And the only thing that Melchizedek did as a high priest was that he blessed people. So when Jesus came, what did he do? He blessed us. What kind of blessing? Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law in order that yes he redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us and he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come upon us. So Christ came to release Abrahamic blessings upon us. That's one. So blessing he has given. What else did he do? Melchizedek gave Abraham bread and wine. What did Jesus do? He gave us his body, which is the bread. He gave us his blood, which is the wine. And that's the communion. And have we received the blessings? Yes. How about the communion? Do we like it? Yes. Then what else did Melchizedek do? He collected tithes from Abraham. So Jesus has done the same thing. He has blessed us. He has given us bread and wine. And now the tithe, you know, you say is Old Testament. 
I don't know why, why people want to reason along that line. Amen? This is very, very important. So the altar of Abraham was a place of covenant blessings. So when Jacob got there, he was blessed because of the altar. He was blessed because of the altar. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the interesting thing is that the Bible says from that very place there was a ladder. Which means the connection between where you are and the top is through an altar. It's through an altar. It's through an altar. The next thing about altars, number three. The altar is a place of angelic wonders. When the angel appeared before Samson's parents, look at what happened. Genesis, Judges chapter 13 verse 19. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. Angels will do wondrously in your life. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. It came to pass, as the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. So when they offered the sacrifice on the altar, the Bible says the angel did wonderful things. Every wonder in your life will answer to the altar. Angelic wonders answer to the altar. And Bible says that the angel again followed the flame. So whilst natural eyes saw it as a flame and as a smoke going up to heaven, the Bible says the angel saw it as a highway via which he would travel back to heaven. The angel ascended in the flame of the altar back to heaven. So anytime you are building an altar, you see, it's an invisible act when you raise an altar and you drop here. What happens is that you are actually, you are actually building a ladder to your top. It's a spiritual mystery. I cannot, I, I cannot you know, undo it. It's something that God himself has done. So anytime you begin to raise an altar, you are setting yourself up for elevation. You are setting yourself up for elevation. Praise God. Amen. So it's a place of angelic wonders. This is very, very important. And that's what distinguishes a, a, a church from any other building. In church, there's an altar where we come to drop our seats. Where we stand and we pray. Where we do a lot of things. But you see, any other building, it can be an ordinary building. This is a conference hall, but it is different from any other place. Because we have been here every now and then we stand here. An altar has been raised over here. An altar has been raised over here. So it ceases to be an ordinary place. So you can find God, angels, spirits all over in this place. Why? Because we are raising up solid altars. There are some places, certain junctions in this city. I don't want to go into details. Certain junctions in this city where some people have done some dangerous sacrifice. One day I was passing by one of those junctions, suddenly my eyes opened. And I saw that it wasn't one, it wasn't two, it wasn't three. It was thousands of people who had stood at that junction at very odd hours and raised altars. And interestingly, I've been monitoring things that happen around that junction. And accidents have occurred at that junction per my own estimation than any other junction I know of in Tamale. I have personally witnessed countless accidents. You pass and you see that somebody is lying down in blood. So one day I told a certain man of God, I said, one day we need to go to this place and crush these altars. Somebody did it at midnight. We will undo it also. Who will do it? undo it at, at midday? If we are there at midnight, they will say we are doing something. Yes, of course we are doing something, but we will do it at midday. We we'll also go there and pour oil and, and, and crush certain things that have been established. Praise God. Why is that so? By enacting altars, they, they have opened the gate for bloodthirsty demons to hang around there. They have opened the gate. An altar is a gateway. It's the key that unlocks the spiritual world. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Oh, I can't hear you. Praise the Lord. 
is very very important let me show you another one number four an altar is the key that unlocks the heavens an altar is the key that unlocks the heavens this is very very important take me to first kings chapter 18 verse 30 first kings chapter 18 verse 30 let's look at this together and elijah said unto the people come near unto me and all the people came near unto him now take note it had not rained for three and a half years it had not rained for three and a half years the heavens were locked now elijah wants to unlock the heavens and look at why he told, he told the people come near unto me and the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the lord that was broken down let me tell you until the altars are repaired the heavens remain closed some of us have broken altars in our lives broken altars you used to be a giver but now you have stopped giving you used to serve the Lord very well but now you, you have stopped all that you used to fast and pray but now you don't remember the last time you fasted so your boasting is oh you know we used to fast we used to I, we were those we used to we, we used to we used to I told you that I used to is the anthem of the or the slogan of the backslider I used to I used to I used to so you are a former man of God <laughs> praise the Lord amen and Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord may somebody leave this place and go and repair his own broken altars that was broken down next verse and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying Israel shall be thy name next so 12 stones one stone for each of the 12 tribes of Israel and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench about the altar as great as wood I want you to focus on this somebody say as great as would contain you see so it means that he was enlarging the capacity of the altar to contain not just a small altar some of us need to enlarge our, 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 the, the capacity of our altars your altar has been so small the altar has been so so small the altar has been so small Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. A fellow came to me. He wants to contest for MP ship. And we were talking. And I said you can win. But right now you are not ready to win. Because your colleagues have outwitted you already even though it is your, yours to win but it looks like in the realm of the spirit your colleagues have already outwitted you he said how i said i mentioned the name of somebody i said is there somebody like this who is going to contest with he said yes that's my main contender i said you listen this man i mentioned the name of a place i said he has been there and when he went there the sacrifice he made is over fifty thousand ghana cities and he went to about eight different places and each place so so far he has already he's already hitting about 200,000 I say you per what I'm seeing you visited this pastor say yes I say you gave him 1,000 cities say yes I say you I say judge for yourself if <laughs> you are ready for it Because what unbelievers are prepared to sacrifice to their gods. So sometimes it looks like juju is powerful. Is because, that's because God is just quiet and watching us to allow the juju to wear because the people respect their juju more than we respect him. Prepare the altar and increase its capacity. If it used to contain one measure of seed, increase the capacity of the altar so it can contain two measures of seed. Next verse. 
And he put the wood in order. Everything in order. Somebody put your wood in order. And cut the bullocks in pieces. And laid him on the wood. And said, fill four barrels with water. And pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now take note. It hadn't rained for three and a half years. So water was the most scarce commodity in Israel. Anybody who had a small jerry can of, uh, of water, he kept it. And in the morning, they administered the water like, like medicine. He said, hey, children, all of you come. Then you will take a measure. This is 100 mils. Oh yeah, open your mouth. You pour it inside. He said, I have given you water for today. This is what you are surviving on. We are economizing with the water. And pour you to open your mouth. So they were doing economics of water. Water management began then. So you see, they economized the resources available. So at that time, anybody who had a barrel of water, it was so precious and dear to him. Because it hadn't rained for three and a half years. And now Elijah is deciding to pour four barrels of water on the burnt sacrifice. The prophet of Baal just killed their cows and they were dancing and they were cutting themselves. Some of us are not ready to, to make ourselves uncomfortable for the sake of the kingdom. But here are prophets who are calling for Reno and these are prophets of Baal and as they are dancing, they are cutting themselves with knives so that they can sacrifice their own blood in addition to the blood of the bulls for, <laughs> for the thing to happen. Spiritual things are not that easy. Even if you are born again, it is not that easy. Jesus had to crucify, to die. Look at the way he prayed until his sweat was like blood. He prayed. He said that Apostle John prayed so much that it affected when he died. His Apostle James and Apostle John, they are, they are what do you call this place? Their knees were hard were hard like the calves of an animal like the soles of an animal because of constant kneeling down and praying hey, praise God he poured four barrels with water and poured it on the, on the sacrifice and on the wood next and he said do it the second time and they did it the second time and he said, do it the third time. They did it the third time. How many barrels? Talk to me. Twelve. Where did he pour the water? On the altar. And the water ran about the altar. And he filled the trenches also with water. You can't outgive these guys. They were thirsty. They wanted water to drink. But he said, no, sacrifice the water on the altar. What were they looking for? Rain. And you think that all the water, it wasn't raining. The Bible said there were 7,000 other prophets in Israel who had not bowed their knees to Baal. All of them, do you think in their starvation and in their dryness, they didn't pray to God for rain? Some of them were fasting and calling on heaven, release rain, release rain and heaven was still shut but when Elijah came Elijah knew how to unlock the heavens as soon as he came he poured 12 barrels of water on the altar and look at verse 41 after filling the place with water he now told Ahab Elijah said unto Ahab get thee up eat and drink for there is a sound of the abundance of rain by sacrificing water on the altar The heavens were heavily unlocked. The heavens were heavily unlocked. And rain began to pour. Praise the Lord. And in addition to that, you know, the next thing was that Ahab now got up and forgot about the man of God who called for the rain to come. When he saw that the clouds had formed, the Bible says Ahab sat on his horses, his chariot. <laughs> and they just took off they started running and he left the man of God who didn't have a chariot the king that was blessed by the prophet forgot of the prophet and <laughs> you see Ahab immediately entered into his chariots and took off 
and they left and Elijah was left standing there you see and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel next verse Elijah was left standing what will he do but thank God the heavens were open and the Bible says the hand of the Lord came through these opened heavens and came upon Elijah and when it came upon Elijah look at what happened and he gathered up his loins and ran before in other words he ran that's King James English but he overtook Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel a man ran faster than horses that will be your testimony uh -uh. I said that will be your testimony that will be your testimony you will run faster than horses and chariots can I hear your amen roll like thunder how did he provoke the heavens sacrifice 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 praise God there has not been a year since I started ministry that I have not sacrificed up to five months salary on the altar there has not been <laughs> there has not been a year because some things you will pray and pray and pray it doesn't work like that I know Tamale I know the grounds where we are I know the land that God has asked me to come I know the principalities involved in the soil there are certain things that you just have to do you have to act dangerously for your own life and for the assignment some of us we come from places where everything is upside down the things your grandfather did are dangerous and your father came and watered it and you to your Christianity you are not serious about it and everything is fighting you everything is upside down it looks like you are progressing but you are not you are fighting battles but this one too you are not serious about it they raise altars to put you in that trouble and you are not prepared to raise an altar to get out of that trouble altars are mysterious they provoke an open heaven altars provoke an open heaven may your heavens be provoked to open in the mighty name of Jesus Christ in the mighty name of Jesus Christ praise the Lord the two other most powerful things I wanted to share about altars I will continue